Join us for MDS Inspire 2024 happening March 3rd through 5th in Las Vegas, an inspiring three-day event co-hosted with Carbon 6, filled with networking, new connections, and business growth. Why should you attend? We've got 20 plus expert speakers, three days of networking, and zero fluff. If you're in e-commerce, missing this event is a mistake because this is the only MDS event open to everyone. See you there. We, we actively partner with everybody. So our mindset is like, let's just work with everybody. You know, if you're not a shitty person, you might be okay, right? Like as long as you're just like a good dude and keep it real, uh, things might actually work out and you know, you could really make this great dream come true. From the beginning, like to get that first dollar or first few dollars, it's about people believing in you that you can make something happen. Welcome to the Million Dollar Sellers Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Chiquette. Today we have Nassim from Carbon6 on the call, which has an amazing uh, background story. Uh, he's in Toronto. He's a co-founder of Carbon6. The guy has raised, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars for businesses. Uh, and I'm excited to sit down with him and learn a little more about him. Uh, welcome to the show, Nassim. Thanks, Nick. Excited to be here. Yeah, nice, man. So I know you said you're in uh, Coron you're in Toronto right now, I believe, or at least you're from Toronto, but your family's from South Africa. We were just chatting a little bit. You mentioned your mom is from Durban, which I think is uh, super cool. Uh, so talk to us, man. Like, you got such a great story. You know, how did you end up over here, a co-founder of Carbon6, uh, and, you know, after traveling all these countries and seeing all these great places? Um, you know, what brought you here now where you are? Yeah, I guess it's been a random walk over time. So grew up in Toronto, um, spent my early career traveling. So I, I moved to South Africa, worked there for a while. I was in the Middle East, Africa, um, worked in Kenya, Pakistan, uh, the UAE, different parts of the States. I found my way to, um, to business school at, at Harvard, where I met one of our other co-founders, Kazi. That's like, it's the part of the story is that we've been friends for, for a long time okay. and uh, spent my next decade or so between then and now uh, building startups. So built an education technology company um, that reached about 80% of the largest thousand universities. Uh, we sold most of it to a growth equity fund that had uh, invested in a couple of our rounds, um, set up businesses in a couple of other spaces. So uh, invested in a lot of the early, early moving companies in neuroscience and psychedelics, uh, set up a wow. biotech. Yeah. Um, and uh, actually came into Carbon6 as an investor. So uh, okay. Justin, uh, our, like, uh, our, our co-founder and CEO, as well as um, Kazi, co-founder and, and CFO. So Kazi's my um, like a buddy. Uh, the two of them were starting down this, this path. I, I was pretty excited. I threw in money at the beginning. And then you know, a couple of months later, um, I had a bit more time and there was need for another partner at the table. And so hopped in and we've been building it together uh, ever since. It's amazing. You're like a you're like a unicorn in the entrepreneur world. You like went to Harvard. You have an MBA. You're like this school educated guy, but you're like so involved in like startups and businesses. That's pretty amazing. Um, you don't hear that very often. Um, you know, as I as I hear you guys, and this keeps hitting me with Carbon Six. Like you guys are just different. You know, you guys just do things different, which I love because I I I'd like to operate in a different way too. And you always hear people talk about like the ups and downs of like having a partner versus doing it your own, on your own, you know, God forbid you go into business with a friend, you know, that you went to school with. Right. And my take has always been, well, you know, if you're not a shitty person, you might be okay. Right. Like as long as you're just like a good dude and keep it real, uh, things might actually work out and you know, you could really make this great dream come true. What's it like for you guys over there? I mean, obviously we all have good days, bad days, disagreements are going to happen uh how are you guys navigating those things in a in, in a positive way yeah um it's a good question like uh, i think finding people with complementary skill sets is really important um and so like you know you can be friends with all sorts of people but when it comes to people that you're going to work with there have to be different things that people bring to the table and i know you're hopping on with with justin and kazi and um it, they'll speak to that a lot because I think that that's a dynamic that's really important. The thing that became really important to me as kind of I moved through life has been the importance of working with good people that yeah. you trust. And uh, when I think about Carbon Six, like 
it's nobody's first rodeo, right? So we've all built businesses before. We've all exited businesses before. And um, we've all worked with great people in our lives. And if I look at our, our leadership team, like we've just pulled in people that, you know, we've known were great from different parts of our lives before, right? Like um, if I look around our executive table, um, you know, so Kazi and I obviously went to business school together. Our chief operating officer, Moomin, uh, the guy's a, you know, a SaaS veteran. He's, you know, IPO'd a couple of companies before, multiple exits. Uh, he played every role in our uh, software company, Top Hat, like literally from operations to M&A. Uh, so brought him in um, because I, I knew him really well. I knew that he, you know, was the type of guy that was going to build this thing really well. Brought in, you know, our um, VP Ops and VP Engineering and multiple others on our team from that company as well because, you know, we knew the pedigree and I'd worked with them before. Similarly, like, you know, our VP Finance and CRO or people that, you know, Justin had known through, uh, you know, previous lives and, you know, had, had vetted and, you know, brought strong skills to the table. And so, you know, building a company with people that we trusted and could bring in that way, it immediately cut that whole testing out, feeling out period. And it meant that as soon as you plug somebody in, like that person was going to be able to ramp up and move very quickly. Amazing. So like any great relationship, you know, trust is key. Um, and I think you put it, you know, perfectly, like it just cuts through so much of that stuff that, uh, you know, you hear a lot of people talk, you know, bicker back and forth about day to day. And it's like, ah, you know, if you just, just kept it real and we're open and honest and, and, you know, you compliment each other. Well, like, yeah, man, that, uh, that's amazing. And, uh, you know, I'm getting a little taste of that. I'm like in my, uh, I've been one year in with my partner, a little over one year in. Um, and it's been, it's been fun because like things get hard, but we just get harder and we're like stoked on it. We're waking up at like, you know, we had a meeting at like 5 a.m. today about, you know, implementing QuickBooks Enterprise because, you know, the fractional CFO that we brought in, he's fractional, right? When I look back on it, it was just a bad idea. Like, how can we expect this guy who's probably working like with eight other companies to add all this value to our company. Uh, we've spent 12 grand on it and got nothing, you know? And I'm like, man, let's just do this ourselves. And it's so fun. <laughs> and I imagine you guys have a lot of fun at, at work too. I mean, is that how it feels, you know, when Justin calls or Kazi calls, that, you know, or Moomin hits you up? Is it, is it just like a, a fun, productive conversation? Like, how does that go with you guys in meetings? Um, and what does that look like a little for you guys? I think that would be valuable to know as well. Like, are you guys meeting once a week, once a quarter? Um, do you guys have some structure to those things that you think other people would benefit from? Yeah, so there's structure and then there's beyond the structure. So I guess the structure is we have like a week, weekly executive meeting and then, you know, every quarter we try to bring like a, a good chunk of the company to Toronto. So Justin's okay. based in Puerto Rico. Kazi and I are based here. So we set the office up here. Um, and so more than half of our, our staff, at least our North American staff are based in Toronto. And so every quarter we fly a good chunk of the company into Toronto and have like, you know, team meetings, like a little bit of a combination of like some educational stuff, some rah-rah stuff, and like just some productive move the ball forward stuff, which, which really helps given that people are all, are all over the place. But I think beyond that, uh, you know, we just talk every day, right? And so if there's stuff that's coming up, things to work through, um, you know, uh, people are either right beside you or, you know, right there at the pick, uh, you know, at the, the dial of a phone and you're working through problems. Uh, obviously, there was a lot more of it early when we were small because you're working together on absolutely everything. Now that the business is, is, has scaled out a bit, um, you know, you're, it's not quite the same, but, you know, I think being in touch constantly and kind of working through things constantly is so important so that you're always on the same page. Nice, man. It's always great to just hear you know, stuff like that is like inspiring to me, right? It keeps me going and I hope it's inspiring other people too, because, you know, I feel like when you're, when you're a little bit, you know, whether you're going through school when you're younger or you're like in your early start, you know, early days of your journey, you know, that, that light at the end of the tunnel, man, it's, it might, it might, you might not really see it. You know what I'm saying? You're like, I don't know, man, if I really believe this is even possible anymore. Uh, but I'm sure you guys, you know, all had those moments too, at some part of your journey, right? Like we all have to start, uh, somewhere. So man, when I was start started on Amazon, like being a part of those 
like groups were a big thing for me. Going to events is so important. Like in this digital world, this remote working world, I'm seeing people undervaluing the importance of getting together and picking up a phone. You know, everybody wants to like blog their way through it or Facebook post their way through it or YouTube a video to get it done. And I'm like, bro, I already did it. I called this guy on the phone. It's done. Like you spent three days researching stuff. I made a 30 second phone call. Um, so it's, uh, it's good that you guys have all that stuff and it's great to see how successful you guys are. Cause like that shows us the things that we should be doing. You know, if you're wondering, you know, how do I grow a business to this level? Like it's by working with great people, having that trust, getting in person, uh, and doing all those great things, man. Uh, so thanks for sharing, sharing that stuff. I think people are going to get a lot of value out of just knowing, you know, the way that you guys operate and do things. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the way that you do things there at Nassim at carbon six. I know you're, you know, you're raising funds, but you're also looking for businesses to buy. You're assessing those businesses and like putting a value on them and seeing like, what can carbon six do with with this business and yep. i would love to hear how you look at that process especially um what can i do with this business what is the potential can is there more market to address here um yeah you tell us a little bit about that for sure um so we've talked about a few different things so there's the raising money part and then there's the you know um the buying businesses part um ultimately i think a lot of it comes down to the same thing well, when people are buying they're when they're investing especially in the early days um, they're investing in you when when they're looking to sell their business and they have multiple suitors they're also choosing you and so a lot of success early on is about selling yourself your team and like your capabilities um, and like from the beginning, like to get that first dollar or first few dollars, it's about people believing in you that you can make something happen. And as you grow, like, you know, each step you take forward, it becomes less and less about you and more and more about what you've done and the machine you've built. So like, you know, now at Carbon6, we've raised a fair amount of money and, you know, we're going out for some growth capital, right? Which is going to help with M&A and a few of the other things that we want to do. Um, the business, it's less about us, right? It's more about the, the, the achievements that we've had over the past couple of years. And that's what we're being measured on. But, you know, if when I look back at the last few years, uh, it, it wasn't always the case, right? Um, and when we were convincing people to sell us their businesses, it was the same thing. And um, now I think it's a little bit easier in the sense that like we're a little bit vetted. So when we come in and in our you know industry, in our little sector, People know who Carbon6 is. They might not know what we do, but they've heard our name. They've seen our people in an event, and that really helps. Um, the other thing that I think has really helped us on the M&A side is, you know, we we actively partner with everybody. So our mindset is like, let's just work with everybody. And so one of the best ways to get to know somebody um, is by partnering with them, right? Like uh, do a deal with somebody, work on something with them, start seeing how they operate. And, um, you know, if, if that aligns with the way that you operate, then, you know, it's kind of the, a similar thing to what I talked about earlier with, you know, pulling in people you've worked with before. You just get to vet people in, in a different sort of way as partners. And it's part of the vetting process um, on both sides. Nice, man. And so, yeah, I love I love that, you know, idea of just like testing the waters with something small um and and seeing how that goes like what a what a great way to start it's great to be able to do you know have those opportunities right where you can even do something like that um what about what about looking at a business and seeing uh like let's say you were an amazon seller and and you're like man i, I think i want to buy another business and see what i can do with it um you know another amazon business maybe a competitor uh, or maybe not a competitor, right? Like, let's say it's in a different niche and you want to be like, hey, how much more can this niche grow? You know, how many more people are out here, not just on Amazon, but in general? Like, do you have kind of like a a top-down approach to like go about that and say, hey, I think this market is like this big and we can carve out like this, you know, here's the chunk these guys have now, but I think we could, we could get this. Yeah, for sure. I think... There's, so there's generic stuff that works in every industry. So 
you know, when we came into this industry, we tried to understand, you know, what it looked like. And, and none of us had sold on, online on Amazon before. So part of it was just like getting as smart as we could by talking to as many smart people as we could. But there was also a little bit of math involved, right? Like, you know, we could say, okay, well, you know, here's Amazon's TAM. Here's what's being, you know, here's the typical amount that a seller is spending on on SaaS and, and TAM services. Is, uh, TAM is what? Total addressable market? I think, uh, well, yeah, I, yeah, I didn't know that term, you know, like a year and a half right. ago or something. Uh, yeah, so here's the GMV flowing through Amazon, right? So like say it's 700 billion is sold on Amazon, uh, you know, couple percent is being sold, spent on software and, and, you know, some services beyond that, uh, you know, take you to a few percent. So that's the total, you know, addressable market, so to speak for, okay. um, you know, for software and services. And then how we do started, you find yeah. out the software and services? Like, how do you put a number on that? How do you say, we think, you know, 2% of this total market is software. Is that like an av like an industry average type thing, or is there somewhere you go to get that information? So, so there are industry averages and industry benchmarks that you can look at, and it's typically a range, right? Um, and then the way you can verify that is you can do the bottom up. So you go talk to a bunch of sellers and see what they're spending on their software and oh, then talk nice. to some others yeah. and see what they're spending on their agencies. Because like ultimately, if you think about software as a category, like the biggest thing software does is just replace spreadsheets and replace manual labor. Right. And so if you can look at the stuff that people are, are like using spreadsheets for and where they're spending your time, you can actually quantify like a cost or area where, you know, there probably should be software. And if you look at like, you know, agency type functions, there's a lot of agency type functions that your software is not going to, you know, uh, automate out. But like if it's manual tasks that you're farming out to a VA, um, you know, chances are there can be a lot of automation there. Right. And um, yeah. so. Uh, those are some ways where you can just start like you know, just by talking to people and then understanding how they're spending their time and then talking to more smart people and seeing what you know needs to be built. Uh, you can start building that bottom up view at the same time. So when we came into it, we just we had the top down view and then we talked to a bunch of people and we read a lot and we realized, OK, well, there's a pretty big software and services market, but super fragmented and you know, no player had more than a couple percent market share that's a pretty good opportunity, right? Because it's rare that you find an industry that's growing as fast as this one is, um, you know, that's such strong tailwinds behind it where, you know, it's going to continue to move and where there just wasn't a leading player. And so uh, that got us really excited. And then part of how we picked our category was we said, well, within this, you know, it's super fragmented, not yet that competitive, but there's some areas that are more competitive. Like, you know, Amazon PPC is more competitive, right? Like, you know, there was PacView, there was... Um, Sky, there was Perpetua, there was Tecometrics, there was Quartile, you know, and the list goes on. Um, and, you know, when we looked at certain other categories, there just simply wasn't the same level of competition. So that was one of our overlays. The other overlay for us was thinking about, okay, well, you know, who is the customer that we want to go after? Um, and where does that customer sit? And where is that customer? What does that customer buy? So like, you know, there were a lot of people out there that were targeting newbie sellers and that was a you know great business years ago like whether it was course creators you know or people or, or literally like you know keyword research tools um or product research tools like everybody needs a product keyword research tool uh, the problem with the category a little bit is um you know given the relatively low amount that people pay for the software uh, you need a pretty high volume of soft of customers so you're constantly having to fill up your funnel with newer sellers so um one of the things that made us not choose that category, aside from the fact that there were a couple of strong competitors in Jungle Scout and Helium 10, was um, that you know we felt like there were larger contracts to go after in other places with bigger sellers who you know had different needs than where they would pay more for things. So where you could you know basically get to the same amount of revenue with a far smaller number of customers. So those were the types of things we th started thinking about, um, and what we realized was, you know, there are millions of people trying to sell online, you know, a couple get to an active, a couple million have an active listing on Amazon. It's really 150,000 that represent like 80% of Amazon sales volume, something like 10,000 3P sellers at least, um, control close to 50% of the 3P market. On the 1P side is, you know, even more concentrated. So if you could build a business that was doing just that and then had a few products, you could start cross-selling, you could really start increasing your customer lifetime value. So those are the types of things we thought about. Um, if I were to like take this all the way back to your question and think about this from the lens of, um, you know, an, an Amazon seller, an MDS seller who has, you know, great skills in growing Amazon businesses in particular, 
I'd start thinking about, well, cool, what are the interesting opportunities out there and where can I add the most value? And so part of that might be exactly exercise you're mentioning where like, so there's a bunch of tools out there that calculate, help you calculate, you know, market share. Um, so you can kind of go, you know, whether you're looking at, you know, Jungle Scout or, you know, Smart Scout or, you know, doing it yourself um, or like, you know, any of the other tools um, to like start looking at market share. Like there's a bunch of tools that will help you assess um, different categories and you can say, well, what, what is fragmented? What's not? But I think there's also some other overlays that I'd probably have if I were um, an MDS seller. Because I'd say, well, what am I truly excellent at, right? Like the things that an MDS seller, like MDS sellers in general are excellent because like, you're entrepreneurs, you'd be able to figure things out that most people haven't, right? And so that for me is just a transferable skill set. Like it's, it's, it tells me that, you know, you've, you're already in the top fraction of a percent of people that can do that sort of thing and, and surmount that and they kind of climb and climb the mountaintop in such a way. So like, I think that's kudos. It means that you can do a lot more than this. But when you're focused on this, so what are the specific unique things you bring to the table? One thing I think about is like DDC. Because like what we what we do a lot of analysis out is like, okay, uh, how much GMV is there in different businesses? And we see that like um, there's a couple of flavors, right? So there's Amazon first businesses and we, we serve a lot of them um, that don't really go outside of Amazon. Because, you know, as you know, as a, a seller, like there's a lot that goes into optimizing your, your Amazon business. Um, and it's very different, right, to be selling... Um, on Amazon, especially if it's like a slightly more commoditized product than building DC brand. A lot of the folks on the DTC side, um, they either ignore Amazon because they don't understand it or they ignore Amazon because they think that the margins are too low or they're just worried about the brand perception being on Amazon and they just don't touch the channel. And so when we start, when we look at GMVs across a pretty large subsect uh, of, of DTC sellers and typically we find them to be very under-optimized on Amazon. Like, you know, Amazon is 40% of, um, you know, of online sales in North America. Yet for most of these DDC businesses, you're seeing, you know, zero, three, five, 10% of their sales on Amazon. So where there's a zero, like that's a huge opportunity for somebody that's a, an MDS member, right? It's like, okay, find a DDC business that's doing whatever it might be doing. Um, take a look at branded search terms and see, okay, well, you know, is, are people actually looking for this on Amazon? Like this could be a great logical product extension. And now you're bringing something to the table that nobody else brings because you've got, you know, the skills to actually operate the Amazon business. Uh, equally interesting is like an under-optimized DTC business where, you know, you've got an Amazon business, you've hired some, you know, maybe some agency that may or may not be good to run your business, or maybe you've hired some people that may or may not be good to run your business. Uh, do the assessment, right? And say like, how well are these people operating this business? How much headroom is there for me here? Because like, that's just a logical opportunity. Um, the second thing that I would look at is just like, okay, where you know a category and you know something really well, then like, yeah, yeah, who's performing well, who's not. Um, and so those would be like, that would be the second category. Amazing. Yeah, man. I love, uh, I mean, you just, you, that conversation, like you could tell you got a lot of experience. Like you're, you know, the, the marketing lingo, the finance lingo, the acquisition, um, you know, you're definitely seeing the 360 view of all that stuff, which is, uh, it's just super cool to hear, hear that come through that message. And I, and I love the, the different, you know, perspective as well as looking at a D to C business and, and seeing what you can do with it on Amazon and looking at those branded terms. Um, I know you're not an Amazon seller, but you sure as hell sound like one. <laughs> I can tell, you know, you know, all the lingo, the big players, uh, you know, what's important. Uh, and what the focus on, man. Uh, very cool. Very cool. Well, thanks for sharing that, man. I think, you know, one, one last question I have for you, because like, where do you, like, what newsletter do you read, right? Like, where do you get your information, you know, at the level you're at to like understand and stay up to date, like on the things you just talked about? I think that would be valuable to know. Like I would sign up for that newsletter. <laughs> so, um, I, I think one of the things I think I, I feel fortunate about is just having lots of people in my network that are sending me stuff. So I'm in a bunch of chat groups where people are all over okay. Twitter, like who have a lot more time on their hands than I do. And they're just sending me constant like tweets and insights and this and that. So if you're around friends who are news junkies, like get into chat groups with them. So that's my first piece. Uh, okay. The, in terms of the podcasts I listen to, um, like I'm sure you like, you might've listened to this one. Like a lot of folks do like uh, the all in podcast is just a, it's it's awesome. Like, do you listen to all in podcast? I I've heard of it, but I haven't listened to it. 
Okay. So I, I'm just like a huge fan. I think if there's like one business podcast to listen to, like that's the okay. one because it's like just on every week, it's like four like brilliant dudes um, like in the tech space just talk about everything from like, you know, what's happening in business to geopolitics. And so you get a pretty good rundown of like the news stories of the week, but then also like their views on what's actually happening. Um, and you get it from like an investor's perspective, which I find pretty fascinating. Uh, and uh, they try to take like a balanced view or like they're, they're having any presidential candidate who'll have them on the podcast. Um, and like they, so they, they had like the VEC on there, but then they got like the dem democratic guys on there. Um, they haven't had, you know, Trump or Biden, but they're getting like a decent cross section. So you actually get like, you know, differing, differing perspectives coming up, which is, which is quite cool. Um, cool. the other ones that I like a lot are like the acquired podcast. Um, like this okay. is a lot not for news, but just for like, from the perspective of like a founder, if, and an entrepreneur, like these guys go deep, they'll do like four hour episodes where they will like dig in to like everything about the story of this business and like what it is that allowed a business to, to be like truly exceptional. And they'll take like businesses like NVIDIA, right? Which like, so obviously like in the, the AI space is literally like the defining company of like, well, I guess open AI, but if you actually look at like picks and shovels being like, you know, the most important thing in the gold rush, like they're the picks and shovels company, right? Um, and so like going through the story of how they won, right? Or like LVMH, like what is it that drove them, right? Like Nike, what is it that drove Nike? So um, that would be a, another one that I really, I really love. Amazing. And do you do any like, um, is there, because I know there's some websites out there where you can see like some pretty good industry, you know, average type stuff. I forget what they are. I've come across, I think some of them are paid. Um, or do you mess with any of those or recommend any of those? Um, it's a good question. Like, I actually don't really look at many of the paid, like many paid sites for information. Like, I'm just reading typically what's what's happening in the news. Uh, we do end up because, like, when I think about our industry insights, like, um, we have access to a lot of our own data at Carbon Six. Yeah. Where, yeah. Like, we're auditing like billions of dollars of of Amazon GMV, and so uh, we can typically tell like interesting things like so for example um you know q3 of 2022 to q3 of 2023 your amazon your average amazon seller shrank by seven percent um mm. q4 to q4 they actually shrank by 13 percent, which like you know it said things were actually getting worse last quarter versus the previous quarter so like you know we're, we're talking about like the stock market's rising like there's conversations around how we're coming out of it but the, the underlying data suggests that the consumer is being hit far worse than uh, at least progressively worse. Um, and so uh, I do think we're going to come out of it. I think when interest rates, you know, I, I don't, I'm not an economist, right. But as interest rates, um, you know, decrease, like it stands to reason that we're going to, the things are going to get better, but um, yeah. it speaks to me a lot about what's actually happening in the economy and, you know, the challenges that are being faced by our customers and, you know, by, by, by sellers in general. Um, the, okay. The MDS seller though, um, interestingly, like the, if I think about like the categories that are worst hit, um, the, the categories of seller that were, that are doing the worst are the tiny ones. So like the sub $500,000 seller is the second, was the second hardest hit. Uh, and the aggregator was the hardest hit. So like the aggregator shrank, um, by the largest chunk followed by the okay. small seller. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, sounds like there's some opportunities out there, man. I mean, that's kind of what me and my business partner have done a couple times, nothing like crazy big, you know, count on one hand type thing. But, uh, you know, it just seems like there's some opportunities out there, uh, with everything that's going on in the economy and stuff like that. Um, now seeing this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for coming on. I, I really appreciate and respect what you bring to the table. Um, and, and thank you so much for sharing some wisdom with us. Uh, am I going to see you in Vegas for Inspire? I know you guys are co-hosting this year. Yeah, we're, we're co-hosting. Uh, I'm going to be giving a keynote at, uh, at Inspire. So yes. I'm looking forward to, to hanging out with you guys there. All right, man. Well, I'll see you in Vegas. Good stuff. Cheers, Nick. Appreciate you having me. Yep. Thank you.